Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. I am very lucky to have in my possession a copy of Warhammer Age of Sigmar Crypt Hunters. This is one of the bookshelf games from Games Workshop, which was not available in the UK. But subscriber Glenn Dean sent me this copy all the way from America so I could take a look at it. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing in this video. For those of you who don't know, Crypt Hunters is kind of an evolution of Lost Patrol. Lost Patrol is a 40k themed game that originally came out in 2000 and it was pretty good. But what I have here is the 2016 second edition, which is not so good. They crammed extra miniatures into the game that weren't really necessary and it affected the way the game plays and the rules couldn't cope with it. And it's a game you really have to tinker with to get the best out of it. And if you want to see Lost Patrol in action, I have done several playthroughs on the channel. I have played through with the original 2000 rules and with the 2016 rules and with some special rules from White Dwarf magazine that involve Terminators. But I call Crypt Hunters an evolution. It's certainly not a reskin. Games Workshop have changed the setting to the Mortal Realms, but they have also integrated some more advanced rules. There's more for the villains of the game to do, a little bit more strategy, and it's generally a more robust game. It's certainly not a case that if you've played Lost Patrols, Crypt Hunters is going to have nothing for you. While the games do share core DNA, they are different games. But let's take a quick look inside this box. Of course you get your rules book. This is a 16 page booklet. It has a very, very small amount of fluff about the Stormcast Eternals and the Night Haunts, which are the two opposing factions in this game. But it's mainly just a comprehensive set of rules. There are also campaign rules, which allow you to string games together, making it a little bit tougher for the Stormcast Eternals to win. And as an added bonus, in the back there are a page of achievements. This is a really nice addition. We've previously seen this sort of thing in Assassinorum Execution Force, and it really helps to bake in replayability, something which can be lacking from things like Lost Patrol, where you're pretty much doing the same thing over and over again. These achievements are special things that you can aim towards, like complete the game without taking any damage. But there are also special achievements where you take on a handicap in order to make it a tougher win. So you get extra bragging rights if you still manage to pull off a victory. So that's a nice little addition. You get four punch boards, which mainly comprise the 32 crypt tiles that you will be playing each game over. But there are also some tokens on there. There are wound counters and also a few other special tokens for marking game effects. The board art is really nice, it's really evocative. I prefer the Lost Patrol art, but it's a completely different thing. It's comparing apples to pears, really. It's a jungle compared to a crypt. And you can see there are some special tiles here. We have the Abyss tiles, which will eat up the Stormcast Eternal's movement. There are the Soul Traps, where you can spawn additional Night Haunts. This is the special Winch tile, which is one of the objective tiles you need to get here and acquire a winch before you can complete your game. This is the Hishian Illuminator. This is the final goal. You have to get the winch to here. This is the stairwell tile. You only use this in campaigns. It links together separate maps. This is the starting location. And then this is a spear trap. Any Stormcast moving into a spear trap will suffer an attack and may take damage. There's a set of three custom dice, and this is one of the ways in which this game deviates from Lost Patrol. And I will be talking a little bit more later in the video about differences between Lost Patrol and Crypt Hunters, just in case that's helpful for people. But these custom dice have lightning bolts, which indicate hits for a Stormcast player, and skulls, which indicate hits for a Night Haunt player. So when you're making an attack, you will roll a certain number of dice, and you are looking for your specific faction icons. Another indication that you're getting a game that is a little bit more involved than Lost Patrol is the Wedge of Cards. These include unit cards for the Stormcast Eternals and we can see some stats here. We have the number of dice they roll when attacking, the number of spaces they move when making a move action and the number of hits they can take before they die. You also get unit cards for the Night Haunts but they're not really necessary because the Night Haunts are far more simplistic than the Stormcast. You get one card for your regular Chain Rasps, there are no special rules for those, and then you get a card for your special Dread Warden character who does get a special ability. 
and then you get 10 power cards for each faction. And these are used at different points in the game to gain particular benefits. For example, this is a Chain Rasp Spectral Assault. It says play this card before one or more Chain Rasp will attack a tile. When those Chain Rasp attack, roll an extra attack dice. And of course, the power cards for the Stormcast Eternals do different things. This one is Here I Stand, which will prevent a Castigator from moving this turn, but it also prevents them from being injured or slain. So you can block up a tunnel, stop the Chain Rasps getting past, guard your retreat. There are also two reminders of the round sequence. And this is something, again, where the game deviates from Lost Patrol. While there are similarities, the round structure is different to Lost Patrol and it works much better. And finally, you get your plastic. You get one frame of the easy build chain rasps. These have turned up in a few other places. They were in the Age of Sigmar Soul Wars starter set. And they were also in issue one of the Age of Sigmar Partworks magazine. And uh, they're really good. They are really, really evocative of the theme of these spectral entities rising from their graves. They are really neat and they go together really well. Um, I've built some before on the channel, I believe. Um, I actually have some already assembled. Hold on one moment, if we do this, we can look at some I made earlier. So obviously this one has been primed ready for painting. And we're not gonna look at all of them. There are 10 in total, nine of them are regular chain rasps and then you get one Dread Warden. And then you get one frame of your golden girls and boys. This is a set of castigators with a griff hound. These have also been available in other places. They were in the small Age of Sigmar starter set. I believe it was called Soul Strike. I always get those names mixed up because they're all very similar. But again, very nice miniatures, go together really easily. I have some of these already assembled as well. I wonder how good my editing skills are. Here we go, this is the leader of the Castigators. He's taking his helmet off and he's holding his uh, great big bow thing over his shoulder because that's the best way to stride into combat. And before we move on, I do just want to take a moment to point out the insert for this game. All of the bookshelf games have really good inserts. First of all, we have spaces for all of the miniatures when they are assembled. And these are really deep cavities with the miniatures held in place by their bases. So you can actually put your finger underneath them. And that means they're not leaning against anything. It's very unlikely they're going to break. We then have holding receptacles for all of the tiles. And underneath these, we have a space for the dice. And underneath these, we have spaces for all of the tokens and then we have the cards here. There is no room to house the cards once they are sleeved, but I really couldn't care less about that. I very rarely sleeve my games. If I was to sleeve every game in my collection, I would probably have spent more on sleeves than buying every Games Workshop product I ever wanted. I tend to just sleeve things like my old retro copies of Space Crusade and Hero Quest and things like that. But anyway, nice to see a well thought out insert, which is going to keep those miniatures safe and keep everything held in place. While this game shares some DNA with Lost Patrol, it is quite a different experience. And that's largely to do with the change in the turn structure. There are of course many other differences. I've already mentioned the combat is different because we are using custom dice. We also now have a more complicated objective. We have to get to the winch tile, then we have to get to the Hishian Illuminator. Whereas in Lost Patrol, you just need to survive until you find the drop pod. That's hard enough. And then of course you have characters with special abilities. The leader of the Castigators has a special ability. The Dread Warden has a special ability. And then you have those cards that you can introduce which give you special one use abilities. The Stormcast Eternals have more than one wound, so it's now possible to get injured but carry on fighting, whereas in Lost Patrol, your scouts were incredibly squishy and would die instantly. And even the way that the Night Haunts move is very different to how the Gene Stealers moved. The Night Haunts can now choose to either drift an unlimited number of spaces along a corridor, or they can move into an adjacent tile phasing through walls. This gives them two distinct ways of moving around the board and two different strategies for approaching the Stormcasts. And yet for all those changes, the biggest thing I think is the change in the structure of the turns. Anybody who's seen any of my Lost Patrol playthroughs will know that you start in the central tile as we have here, 
and then the gene stealer player will build the starting tunnels. There are five routes off from this central location and the gene stealer player has to pick an edge and then draw a tile and place the tile on that edge. And at the start of the game, you may have a board that looks something like this. After the gene stealer player has chosen an edge and drawn a tile, they pretty much have free reign on how they place that tile as long as they continue the path and don't purposefully create dead ends unless they have no other choice. And if it's a straight path, they will immediately draw another tile to continue the path. And once that is done, you go into a turn sequence, which is the scout player will take actions, then the gene stealer player will remove old jungle tiles from the board, and then the gene stealer player will place new jungle tiles, then the gene stealer player will take their actions, and then finally the gene stealer player will launch any attacks. And that creates a specific problem in how the game plays out. Each marine on the board can take up to two actions, and that can be moving or shooting, and you can move twice, shoot twice, or do a combination of both. And your aim is to explore your way through the stack of tiles until you get to that drop pod. So in all cases, the marine player will always be trying to get to the edge of the board to reveal new tiles. So let's assume that at the end of our first marine turn, we've done this. I don't know why we would have done this. That's a bad move. But regardless, now in the second step of the turn, the gene stealer player will remove any jungle tiles that need to be removed. And the way that works is you remove any tiles to which a marine does not have line of sight, as long as that tile would still be out of line of sight if any marine was to move up to two spaces. So on this first turn, we wouldn't remove any of the tiles because although we do not have line of sight to this tile here or this tile here or this one or this one, if any of our marines was to move up to two spaces, they could get back to this central location and they would still have line of sight through them. So no tiles would be removed in this instance. And then after shrinking the board, the gene stealer player places new tiles. And these are placed much like at the beginning of the game where you have to continue any path that a marine can see down. So we would have to put new tiles here and here because of these marines, here and here because of this marine, and over here because of these marines. And there we have it. We have continued our paths as far as possible. And now having done that, the gene stealer player gets to take their actions and they get three actions in any given turn. And those actions are to place a gene stealer, place an infestation token, which they will never do because there's no point, or move. And you will note that attacking is not one of the actions because attacking is done at the end of the round. And of course, the gene stealers will appear at edge tiles with unexplored edges. And that means we can spend our three actions this turn doing this. We now have three gene stealers adjacent to our marine and in the final stage of the turn, those gene stealers get to attack. And the way gene stealer attacks work is they score a flat two points per gene stealer. So our attack value is six. The space marine player has to roll a dice and really they're looking to roll higher than the total of the gene stealer attack. If they do that, they get to kill one gene stealer and they stay where they are. If they draw, they get pushed back. And if they lose, they die. The problem for our Marine is whenever you are entirely on your own and you're attacked, you have to minus one from your dice roll, which means even though normally our best result would be a draw, in this case, we cannot hope to win and our Marine instantly dies. There are ways in which Space Marines can get bonuses to their dice roll. The Sergeant down here, he gets plus one to his dice rolls as standard. And our Heavy Bolter, who is here, will give you an additional plus one if he is covering your tile. In other words, if he has line of sight to your tile, but is not in the tile. And of course, as long as you're not on your own, you don't suffer the minus one to your dice roll either. But regardless, in most instances, it's very easy for the gene stealers just to pop up adjacent to them and attack them immediately. And it really does become a game of attrition. Crypt Hunter starts out much the same way as Lost Patrol. You have all of your Stormcast Eternals on a central location. And it's in fact the only time during the game when you can have all four of your Stormcasts on the same space because of hex limitations. But as soon as you start to set up the board for the first time, you will start to see there are more decision points. First of all, the Nighthaunt player will now draw a tile first and then decide where to place it when creating the initial board. Let's assume we've ended up with this. We now begin the first turn. And remember, in Lost Patrol, the first thing that happened was the Marines activated. 
This is now no longer the case. The first thing that happens in a turn is you place new tiles you can see. So in the first turn of the game, you skip this phase because you've already done that in setting up the board in the first instance. But you can see that this immediately opens up new possibilities for the Stormcast players because now you're positioning the tiles at the start of their turn and they can move into those tiles this turn. Whereas in Lost Patrol, you're moving and then placing the tiles. In effect, you're still doing things in the same order. You won't place tiles until you can see them, but now you're placing them at the beginning of your subsequent turn rather than immediately after your move. And that means that the Nighthaunt player will not be able to take advantage of any new tiles you explore this turn. And that's a big, big change in the rules and really does change up how the game plays and the strategies that the Nighthaunt player is going to adopt. Having placed any tiles you can see, you will activate your Stormcast Eternals. In the activation phase, it's very similar to Lost Patrol. Each of your Stormcasts gets two actions and it's either moving or attacking. The difference here is you now have a move value. So rather than moving one tile, you may be able to move several tiles. This is really only applicable to the Griffhound who has a movement value of two. All of the other Stormcasts have a movement value of one anyway. Of course, in our simple example here, I haven't placed out all of the Stormcasts, but we will assume our Stormcast Eternal moves to here in order to explore two tunnels at once. However, remember, those new tiles will not be placed until the beginning of our next turn, and that means we will not get any Night Haunts spawning directly on top of us. We now remove any tiles from play, and this is similar to Lost Patrol. You remove any tiles that you cannot see unless by moving one space you would be able to see them. And then you have a new phase called the Night Haunt Reinforcement Phase. Remember, bringing new Gene Stealers into play is an action in Lost Patrol and is done in the Gene Stealer player's action phase. Here we have a separate reinforcement phase. And in the reinforcement phase, you work your way around the board, placing chain rasps on any tile that has an unexplored edge. And you will place a number of chain rasps equal to the number of unexplored edges. For example, up here on this tile, we would place a single chain rasp, while as over here on this tile, we would place two chain rasps because there are two unexplored edges. You also get to place a chain rasp on any soul trap, which is this green tile here. So we would end up with this situation, except one of these regular chain rasps would normally be a Dread Warden, because if you already have four chain rasps on the board, you can summon a Dread Warden instead. But my Dread Warden is not immediately to hand at the moment, so we are pressing on without them. But what you will notice here is that while the Night Haunt player has a lot more units on the board than they would from summoning three Gene Stealers, they have not been able to summon them immediately adjacent to our Stormcast we have to spend some actions to move into position in order to make those attacks. We don't just get to start immediately wailing on our targets. And that's the benefit of not revealing any new tiles until the beginning of the next turn. And this leads us on to the last phase of the game, which is the Night Haunt player's action phase, where they would normally get to take three actions, but if they have a Dread Warden on the board, they get to take four instead. And an action can be moving, drifting, or attacking. So now your attack actions aren't free actions as they are in Lost Patrol. They are something you have to pay an action to do. And that means no matter how many Night Haunts you have on the board, you are limited by the number of actions you have available. And as you have to spend some of those actions to move into an attacking position, it's going to be much harder to get those strikes on the Stormcast. And the Stormcast have more opportunities to move around the board, making space, and here there's more of a positional puzzle for the Night Haunt player to solve than there is in Lost Patrol where it's just a case of throwing as many Gene Stealers in the path of the Marines as possible. Here the Night Haunts have two different types of movement that they can use to their advantage. One type of movement is simply to be placed into an adjacent tile. For example, I could pick this Night Haunt here and I could just move him here. Even though that's a wall, we just pass through it. But the second type of movement is called a drift. And when you drift, you can be moved anywhere on the board that you have line of sight to. And furthermore, as you drift, you can take any other night haunts with you that were on your starting space or any night haunts you pass through on your way. So we could use one drift action to move these two night haunts here at the same time. And we would drift them to there. And if there had been a night haunt on this space, 
we could have picked them up on the way. And now of course we are in a position to use an attack action to attack our Castigator, for which we would roll one dice for each of our Night Haunts and each Skull would inflict one wound. And that's it, really a lot more for the Night Haunt player to think about. And by delaying the placement of new tiles, you are forcing the Night Haunt player to think more strategically, to spend more actions, to burn actions getting into position. Because of course what would happen now is we would start a new turn, we would place all of the tiles we can now see, so we would place new tiles here and here, and then we would go into the Castigator's phase where we could start by shooting at the Night Haunts that are directly next to us, and then we could advance into those new tiles. And then we can use those tiles to create space between us and the Night Haunts again, so when it comes around to their activations, they are spending actions yet again to move into an attacking position. It becomes a much more cat and mouse affair than Lost Patrol. It's much less a battle of attrition. There is still, of course, a battle of attrition here. You have a fixed number of Stormcasts against an unlimited number of Night Haunts. But it doesn't feel like you're just throwing bodies into the meat grinder here. You are playing positionally. You are moving around the board. You are constantly exploring new places. It's a much tighter rule set, which produces much more interesting situations. But I think I've probably talked for long enough about this for now. There is so much more still to say about it, but I think it's going to be better to see that happening in a playthrough. I will be doing a playthrough on the channel at some point. So for now, I'm just going to say thank you once again to Glenn Dean for sending this to the channel. I really, really do appreciate your generosity. And that's it from me for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please consider pressing the like button. If you really enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I'll see you all again very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.